So I'm here with Sean Kenny, and I've got, I think for my first question, it's kind of interesting. I was looking at your, your biography, and Cycle, uh, Cycle Psycho, mm -hmm. Terminal Island, Corpse Grinders, The Toy Box. I don't know if there's a better description of the exploitation 70s genre. Absolutely. I, I'm wondering, you know, it, it was such an interesting time. What was it like, first of all, on set, and then following that up? Mm -hmm. What, it, what like? Why do you think that was such a popular genre in the 1970s, and why did that come around? Well, I think Billy Jack started it, and uh, Tom Laughlin was the progenitor of that. And I think Tom Laughlin was smart, and the way he did it, a lot of other guys jumped on board and said, "Hey, we can do that too. We can get some up-and-coming actors, let them do a little, uh, you know, you know, good acting. But you know, the scripts don't have to be marvelous, but they have to have a hook." So that's why they did biker films. I remember Jack Nicholson telling me that's how he started. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of us started with uh, exploitation films. It was a great platform. It's just like a breakout film today that some people do. Look, why did Christian Bale do American Psycho? Do you think that wouldn't be a exploitation film today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So people had a platform. And also there wasn't a lot of stuff having to do with uh, restrictive directing. They'd say, would, how would you do this scene better than the writer wrote it? I said, okay, let me do it ad lib. And we'd ad lib stuff. No problem. They didn't have the writer on set. They didn't have people that would be telling them, oh, they shouldn't be acting that way. Uh, that's not the way I wrote it. You know, On productions now, they even have some of the writers, a lot of the directors are the writers. Mm -hmm. And if you devoid from the way their dialogue was written, rather than doing it in real time, they said, oh, I, you had to make a point at this point. Uh, a lot of actors don't have the liberty to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, let, let's get your opinion on Billy Jack since you brought that up. Is that one of the best scenes ever where he says, I'm going to take this foot and hit you on that side of the yeah. face? And I know. <laughs> yeah, it was good. Yeah, he, he was quite a guy. Uh, in fact, he came out with a thing called four walling. I don't know if you know this. You probably weren't around at that time. But four walling was a way that you cut out the distributor and you actually went to the theater owner and said, look, I'll pay you the highest rate that you got this year for the two weeks I want to own the theater. I want to collect all the receipts plus the popcorn and everything. And they said, fine, fine. So Billy Jack started that in Los Angeles because they didn't run his film more than four or five days. And he said, we're getting screwed, man. I said, I know this movie's going to catch on. Sure enough, he went and he four walled it. He four-walled it so successful that he went and rented five theaters. Then he had ten theaters he rented, and the distributors went nuts. They blackballed him. They said, don't use this guy. Don't ever put him in a movie again. They get him out of our hair. He's cutting into our industry, blah, blah, blah. And that's a true story. So smart businessman, but it kind of backfired on him. Yeah, because his second film, Billy Jack Goes to Washington, and the other, he did a Western, I think, at the time. It was like set in Spanish California. Well, it wasn't bad, but I think that maybe if you're not objective at that time and you're getting a lot of press, you think you could direct this yourself. I don't know if he did. Maybe he didn't get a strong enough director. Maybe the script wasn't strong enough. But I think if he had better material, he probably could have done it. Could have lasted longer. Now, now let's go to Get Smart, which is one of my favorite oh, yeah, retro yeah. shows. Mm -hmm. Do you have any stories about being on set or maybe with Don yeah. Adams? Yeah, or? Don Adams, I don't know if you know this, owned the show. Uh, he, that is why you cannot get the episodes very cheaply or easily. His daughter has all of the episodes, she owns the product, so you have to order it online. You can't find it just anywhere, right? Like Netflix or whatever, right? And so, uh, he was a smart guy. What people didn't know about Don, I liked him a lot. He was a World War II hero. He fought in the Pacific, and he uh, was a Navy officer. And in fact, the episode I was in, temporarily out of control, I'm playing a lieutenant. He comes on board for his monthly uh, reserve meeting, and I get hassled with him, and that's my little part in that. But he was a good guy, and I liked uh, the chief that was his, uh, his uh, right-hand guy. And they were great to work with. And they were, you know what? When you're a pro, you're a pro. When you're a really good pro, you don't, things just come and go and you don't make a big deal out of it. And Don never made a big deal out of it. He says, yeah, let's roll with it, let's roll with it. And you know, it seemed to all work out for him. Now, do you have a favorite moment, The Craw or Mr. Big or any, any did you watch that show when you were? No. No? Uh, well, I met, I met um, Barbara Feldon recently. And I always liked her, 99. <laughs> and uh, I met her and I said, you know, your show, I was only on it one episode. I said, but it really is a great show. It was a great show. And he, she said, she had nothing but high praise for Don. Mm -hmm. 
And so I, I didn't watch it that much. I, I think I watched the pilot when it first was shown. But you know, when you're an actor, mm -hmm. I'll tell you what's interesting about being an actor. You don't want to watch a lot of TV. You don't want to watch a lot of shows. You want to be a familiar with what the show's about. Like if you have to read for the show, mm -hmm. you have to know what the characters are. But you really don't want to watch a lot of TV or a lot of movies because you get predicated in your mind on you seeing so much acting, so much acting. You don't know whether uh, you have an original style anymore. I don't mean to castigate, but I think Spielberg watched too many movies. Because if you look at Private Ryan, there's a scene cut right out of Sahara with Humphrey Wilgard, where he makes the German dig his own grave, German soldier. That's stolen right out of it. That happens more than we'd like to admit. That's why I don't like to watch too many movies, because too many. I mean, I like when it's original stuff, but I think you've got to be careful as an actor. I think you have to kind of... Yeah, because actors are great imitators, a lot of them, like my friend Michael can do every kind of accent, and I, I'm pretty good at accents, and you don't want to watch too much stuff because you get, kind of go, wow, what if I have to do that role, I might be imitating this guy, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Now let's go to Star Trek, yep. uh, we're here for Star Trek, Right. What, what, what do you take away from that, how come it's lasted for 50 years, how come your role, how come you're still here talking about Star Trek 50 years later, it's just amazing to think really from what um, it was. It, it's a, it's a, it's a, how should I say, it's a perennial, it, it's really something that we all have in our minds, and maybe we don't practice it sometimes, but we all want to see good over bad, we all want to see something come out well for everybody involved if it can, and that's the one thing Gene expressed to us is, we have to have great themes in this show, and that's why you always saw them joking in the last take is Kirk would always be chiding Spock, or Doc would be saying something kind of, well, you know, next time we go to somewhere, we're gonna prepare ourselves a little better, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, we will, Bones. And you can see that they made that light moment at the end because through the whole thing, it was always, um, as a good film will have, it's the beginning that, and then the final, a uh, plot point is when you never think they're going to get out of it and then they get out of it. Yeah. And that's what's missing today. They can never kill evil in most of these shows. You always subdued evil in Star Trek. Evil was submerged. It was subdued. It was put down. And God forbid it ever comes up again because we'll be back here to take care of it. That's what they don't do today. The opposite now today for the most right. part. That's Game of Thrones and those shows. Now let's go to that final question. Mm -hmm. uh, your, one of your favorite films, you said you have three That's coming three. to mind. Yeah. Um, my most memorable film in my life as a child or even maybe a teenager was It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. I watched The Wild Bunch 13 times. I never saw anything done so well with the performances. And I love the Western genre. And I think the third one, it may have been recently, but I really loved uh, Eddie Redmayne's uh, a portrayal of Stephen Hawking. Yeah, it was, it was some of the greatest acting I've seen in 20 years. Theory of everything. Yeah, I mean, I, I was crying watching him get the news in the hospital that he wasn't going to make it. And there was nobody else there. The, the doctor just jumped up and walked away. And I was crying. And I'm saying to my wife, I said, this is astonishingly good. I said, this guy could have overacted right here. <clears throat> the director could have had a bunch of people going by, which would have looked like TV. But they left you with that, pardon the word, pregnant moment mm -hmm. where he was just, what do I do now? Yeah. Now for It's I a Wonderful was. Life. I love that film. What's yeah, your, is there a favorite moment? I love when he's a kid and, and that um, powerful moment when he goes back to the drugstore after yeah, that mix-up. I, I, lo I, love, I, love I love the part, I love a lot of parts in it, but I think the best, the interesting part that really you wonder what's going to happen next is when, he's, when he casts it all away and says this and says that and then you don't exist and he goes back to the bar and the Italian guy that's running the bar says, who are you? What are you doing here? You remember? And everybody wants him out of there. And uh, he can't believe it. But, but, but you know me. You know me. You're crazy. And you know, he, like you, you, you didn't exist. Mm -hmm. That was, ooh, to me, I still get a chill from that. Can you imagine that? Oh, scary. I mean, you, scary you to that moment. Yeah, of course. And Capra, I talked to him before he died. I wanted him to do a movie I, I had written. And I said, that 
that movie goes beyond. He says, he says it goes beyond me too. He says I, I, you know, I just he, even Frank Capra said that he didn't know how it was going to turn out. They thought it was going to be a, you know, a pablum. You know, we used to say, you know, it's like for kids and everybody. But so many people got got such profoundness out of it. It's lasted you know? the ages. Whoa, let me tell you. Well, thank you so much for this. Welcome. This was absolutely and, great. And I enjoyed your asking me the right questions. Well, thank you're, you. You're very good at what you do. Well, thanks. Yeah. I appreciate great. it. Great. Oh, here, shameless plug. <laughs> My book is out. It's called Captain Pike Found Alive. Dora, can you hand that to me? I got to get a plug in here. <laughs> anyway, you can get it online. I know everybody likes Kindle rather than reading a book, but this is it, Captain Pike Found Alive. It's doing well. Reading's never a bad thing. Never a bad thing. <laughs> Thanks.